Okay. So tonight we're talking about functions. And by the way, just in case anybody hasn't been here before, if you have questions, please type them into the chat while I'm lecturing. When I'm done with tonight's lecture, we can open up the microphones if you've got any questions about labs or about projects or anything like that, feel free to ask them. So tonight we're doing module five and we're talking about functions. Um, and functions are our second foray into reusability because we all know that's my favorite subject. At least if you were here last week, you do. Um, so again, reusability isn't copying and pasting. Reusability is using the same lines of code to handle lots of different kinds of data. Um, and we're going to do everything we've done up through the last four weeks. And now we're going to give it a name. So we can take a block of code and name it and call it by name, just like you have a variable that's named and it holds a value. Well, we now can have a function name and it holds a bunch of lines of code. And there are some syntax about how you get things in and out of a function and we'll go through all of that. But that's the major point of a function. You get to name a block of code that you can call again and again and again. And you can do anything in a block of code that you've been doing in the global scope, including ifs, whiles, fors, all of that. So um, what are the, what's a function? Well, it's just a group of code. That's all it is. And you name it. So like you have local scope inside of an if block. You have local scope inside of a function. Um, and this is really our, our beginning of data-driven code because, and what do I mean by data-driven code? Well, you want to write your code in such a way that it, any data, let's say it's hooked up to this massive database, and you don't know, you may have an idea of the format of the data, but you don't know what that actual data is. So you have to write code that can handle the kinds of data, but not necessarily the actual values. And that's what we're starting to do with functions. We're starting to carve off blocks of code from our program, put them in something named, and then call that whenever it needs to be called with passing in some values and maybe getting some values back. OK, so before you can use a function, you have to define a function. All functions in Python have to be defined before they are called. And there are two parts of a function. There's the definition, and then there's the place where you call it. Def is a keyword. It tells Python, hey, there's going to be this name and maybe some other stuff to the right of me. Anything that is indented under me, do not run until somebody calls me by name. So what def is doing is it is creating a storage space for whatever the lines of code that are that are there underneath that function. And Python's going to take that and it's going to put it in a place and it's going to put a name on it and it's going to wait until somebody uses that name. So the thing that comes right after def is the name of the function. Now, function names are pretty close to variable names in terms of what you can and can't do. So you can't have an exclamation point in a variable name, and you can't have an exclamation point in a function name, those types of things. Um, after that, well, not after that, but inside of that, underneath that, you will have a block of code. Now, the only thing in our block right now is print. Um, but we could have had a thousand lines of code under there, or we could have had two lines of code. It all depends on the problem you're trying to solve. And we have these parentheses. The parentheses have to be there. At minimum, there has to be an open and closing parentheses. And there may be things inside that parenthesis, but at a minimum, those parentheses have to be there as part of the definition of the function. You cannot have def 
without an open and closing parentheses. It's a syntax error, and Python won't let you even, you know, run the code. And then we have our colon. Just like if statements and for and while loops, we have to tell Python where the statement ends. And so they do that again using the colon in Python. So you have to have that colon just like you did with if, else, or if, else, elif, while, for, all of that. So a function declaration is started with the keyword def. Um, it requires the opening and closing parentheses. So the first part is defining a function. The second part is calling a function. Because a function doesn't do anything until it's called. So I have just typed in print underscore pattern. Print underscore pattern is the name of the function. So Python will equate those two and it will do whatever is in the local scope of the print pattern function. So the function call is without the def and it's without the colon. And in this case, the output's just going to be a bunch of stars. So let's go, and I'm going to do a lot of switching back and forth with code. This, I know I usually talk a lot and then go back to the code. We're going to be switching back and forth a lot because I think that the code examples are important, especially in this module. So this is 5111. One, one. Okay. Okay, so this is challenge 511. And you see I've got def print pattern here. And I've just got a little for loop, for i in range 2. Um, and then I call print pattern. So what I've got here is I've got two uh, breakpoints. I've got a breakpoint at line 3, which is the first line inside print pattern. And I've got a breakpoint in the for loop. So why in the world would I put a breakpoint at line 3 if I'm trying to demonstrate something? Because you will be surprised that line 3 does not get executed until you hit line 8. So let's, um, let's edit the configuration. 511. And let's debug, because we all know how much I like to debug things. So you'll notice that I ran the debugger, and it didn't stop on line 3. It stopped, first of all, on line 7. And that is because line 7 is the first line of executable code that can be run in the global scope. 4 is in the global scope. Remember we talked about scope? We said there was global and local. We started that at, uh, at Module 3, where we were talking about if and branching. We learned, we talked a little bit more about local and global scope last week when we were talking about for and while. And now we're going to talk about local and global scope again. Local scope is a couple of places in this file. The local scope that we first see are lines 3 and 4, and that they are in the local scope of print pattern. And then line 8 is the next local scope we see, and that's because it is in the local scope of the for loop that's line 7. So it's important to understand when something is in the local scope and when something is in the global scope. So if I step over line 7, I'm going, I've now print pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm calling the function print pattern. And what Python will do, I'm just going to step over the code, is it will go into the first executable line in the local scope of the print pattern function. And I couldn't say that three times fast if I tried. Um, so it's going to print out a couple of things here on the console. It's going to go back up. We're now I is 1. We're going to call print pattern again, and we're going to print a couple of things. 
So that is basically how the function works. Now I want to show you a few things that are not great. First of all, right now lines three and four, we have two lines that are in the local scope of the print pattern function. And I'm going to do one little thing. I'm going to back up here and I'm going to remove, because I, because I have now left justified print and def, I have removed the print with the pound signs in it from the local scope of the um, function. So if I just add a little breakpoint here and I run my debugger again, you will see that in this instance, unlike the last time, we're stopping at line four instead of stopping at line seven, which was previously the first place where we stopped. And that's because by doing that simple backspace, I removed the print function call with the hashes outside of the print pattern function. That's all I had to do. Now, why is this important? Because it still runs. Well, because that may very well, well be a logic error. When you are dealing with functions, just like when you're dealing with branches and when you're dealing with loops, you have to know what you're supposed to be in the local scope as, a as opposed to the global scope. So it, this was supposed to be in the local scope of the print pattern function. So I will put it there. And when we debug again, we will see that, whoops, Oh, my bad. So when you're taking something and putting it back in the local scope, make sure you get your columns lined up because that's what this just told me, unexpected indent. And you're like, well, but I just tabbed it once. Yes, I did, but I must have hit the space key as well, or I must have done this when I created the function. There we go. Didn't, didn't tab in. So stop and rerun. Now I start out at line seven, just like I did before. And we get our two stars and pounds. And then we're done. OK, so no questions. All right. So we know how to define the name of a function. and we know what the local and the global scope is when it comes to a function, and we know how to call a function. But there's more things you can do with a function. We already know that you can pass things into a function, just like I did a minute ago with a call to the print function and then, you know, a, a string of hashes or a string of stars. So, there are more things you can do. Well, what's the next thing we want to look at? We want to look at parameters and arguments because that's how you get data in to the function or values into the function. So you can do a calculation. Let's just take example like 5.2.3 and they want to print the total inches. So you have a number of feet and a number of inches, and you're going to convert feet to inches and add them all up, and it's going to print the total number of inches. Well, it doesn't make any sense to have print total inches for values. So the, what we have here is we have two parameters, num feet and num inches. So we have our def. We're going to define a function. It's called print total inches. That's the function name. We have the first argument and the second argument. Num feet is the first, sorry, the first parameter, and num inches is the second parameter. And they all parameters are always separated by a comma. Just like when you're creating a list and you put a comma after each entry in the list. Same thing here. You have to put a comma in between each of the parameters. So then I have what's in the local scope. So this is the code block inside my print total inches function. Um, the parameter is a variable that exists only inside the function. So num feet 
only exists for as long as print total inches is being called. So as long as the, the, the compiler is spending time, sorry, not the compiler, the runtime engine is spending time inside of print total inches, num feet and num inches will exist as variables. The minute you get out of that function, they go away. So functions is also a great way to not have to have a massive amount of variables sitting around taking up space. Um, and it's always better to do things with a function if you possibly can. And one of the reasons is because it's easier to test. I know we don't talk about testing in this class, but it's something if you're going to become a programmer that you have to understand. You have to create code that is testable. Um, the value of a parameter is provided by the function call. So here we have defined a function that takes parameters. But how do we get stuff into those parameters? We call it with those parameters. So let's take a quick look again at 523. I've got my print total inches. Professor Lisa is sitting here. She's going to put 5 and 8. So my num feet is 5 and my num inches is 8. So what happens when I call the function? Well, 5 is uh, set, um, five, the value of 5 is set to the num feet variable and the value of 8 is set into the num inches variable or parameter. And then we do the calculations. So we have num feet, we have num inches, and we print out 68. Um, an argument that is a value is just a value that's passed into a function, that's all. And a function must generally have the same number of arguments as parameters in the function definition. Now, there are some uh, ways to get around that, and I will show you that in a little bit. So one thing to note is that arguments are positional. So we're still back on 5, 2, 3. What do I mean by positional? I mean the num feet that's in the function has nothing to do with the num feet that's in the function call. So I could, in fact, swap num feet and num inches. And using the same values, 5 and 8, 5 is num feet, 8 is num inches. Now, a, uh, the parameters in a function are positional. They have nothing. You could have named them x and y, and it wouldn't have made any difference. So now, when I call and put print total inches, 5 is the number of inches and 8 is the number of feet because I switched num feet and num inches from the last time and so now I'm going to get a different output because Python doesn't care the name of the variable which contains the, the value for the argument. Python cares what's first and what second. So the value of 8 is first, so that's going to go into num feet, and the value of 5 is second, so this time it's going to go back into num inches, and num feet times 12 plus num inches is 101. Same code. The only thing I did was swap num inches and num feet. So let's go back. Yes. Uh, how does it know if num feet and num inches is an integer? Okay. Does a call have to have parameters? It does not. If the, for the most part, if the function definition has parameters, then you need to pass the same number of arguments. But you do not have to define a function with parameters. Your function doesn't have to take any. And in fact, um, when you do your game and you are going to print the instructions for the game, um, you don't necessarily need to call that with an argument when you get the instructions for your game. So let's go to 523 
And let's just do a couple things here. Um, so I have feet in inches and inches in feet. And um, I'm going to input those two, and then I'm going to call print total inches. And actually, I don't know that I need to do this. We'll do it real quick. Five, two, three. And I'm going to debug it because I like life in the debugger, and it's going to want me to enter the number of feet. So I'm going to say I'm two feet, and then it's going to want the number of inches, and I'm going to say four inches. And then I'm going, I have feet is two, and inches is four. So right now, if I look at frames and variables, and I look at variables, I have feet and inches. So I'm going to now step into, so this is a new trick with the debugger, okay? We've always been doing this step over thing right here. Well, this is step into. I don't necessarily need to step into because I have a breakpoint in the function, but step into allows me at any point in time to step into the local scope of a function and see what's going on. So you don't necessarily have to have a breakpoint. So if I do step into, now you'll see I have num feet, which is two, and num inches, which is four. So I'm going to do my calculation, and I'm going to print it. And then I'm now going to do the swap, which is inches and feet, instead of feet and inches. I'm going to step into my function. We'll see num feet is four and num inches is two because I simply just swapped those variable names. And it's going to print 50. So that is that, that's the basics of parameters and arguments. Okay. So, um, returns. So now we know how to get data in. We know how to define a function. We know how to get data into the function to let the function do its thing. There's one more part of this, and that is returning information outside of the function. Let's say I do a complex calculation. And when I'm all done with that calculation, I want to show someone the results. I want the external program to know what the results are so I can make a decision. Um, and so I do that with something called the return statement. So again, we have def. We have our function name, which is pyramid volume. In this case, we have three parameters, base length, base width, base, base, sorry. I can't say base tonight. Base length, base width, and pyramid height. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the volume of a pyramid. I've got my local scope. And now in the local scope, we have this new thing inside that code block, which is return. Return is a keyword. And it basically says, take everything to the right of me and pass it back to the global scope or whatever scope called me. So it will actually take the value in pyramid, and it will assign it to whatever variable you have called this function with. And that's the next concept, is to being able to call a function and have the data from that function returned. Um, it's all, return is ever only used inside of a function block. There's no reason to ever use it anywhere else. OK. So we've got our pyramid, and I'm going to put in my length, my width, and my height. So now I am going to call pyramid volume. And in, in that next line of code, we see pyramid equal pyramid vol volume length, width, height. So pyramid, we know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. 
So what happens on the right-hand side has got to have some kind of data to it. So the thing that's going to get assigned to print pyramid is whatever we return from pyramid volume. That's how you read that. I have a variable. My variable's name is pyramid. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is a function call. And I expect that function call to give me a piece of data back. And in this case, it's the volume of a pyramid. So length is 4.5, width is 2.1, height is 30. This is positional. So length is the value of length is placed into base length, so that would be 4.5. The value of width, which is 2.1, is placed into base width. And the value of height is placed into pyramid height, and that is 3.0. So what happens? Well, what happens is we're not going to do a calculation. We have base length times base width times base height times the remainder of the formula. And that's 9.45. So Python is going to take 9.45, and it's going to make it the value for pyramid. So pyramid has essentially been assigned 9.45. Now it can print length, width, height, and pyramid. Um, so yeah, you call a function using its name and providing its arguments. Always remember to define a variable before a function call to use the return value. So if your function returns something, you need to have a place to put it. So that's why we have a variable on the left-hand side, sorry about that, and the function call on the right-hand side. OK, we're about to start talking about objects. And you're like, wait a minute, that's not till wake 8. That's correct. But what we are talking about, the very basic form of an object in any language is encapsulation. And that is to combine data and process all in a little bundle. And functions are objects in Python. Just about everything is an object in Python. But an object has a type, an identity, and a value, and a function is an object. So identity is the name, value is the parameters, and the type is the return type. So those are the three things that make an object and we have them. And I just bring this up because PyCharm brings it up, uh, sorry, Zybooks brings it up. And I think it's important to understand where the different components fit within the language. So a function is an object, a class will be an instantiation, uh, sorry, an object will be an instantiation of a class. Um, so that's, that's all I'm going to say about that. It's just an introduction. OK, so we've seen this before. We're seeing it again. Scope indicates when a variable is available for use. Local scope, global scope. Those are the only two we care about in this class. The local scope would be inside of a function. And the global scope is the top level program. So uh, for anybody who hasn't been here, I showed this in week three. And I talk a lot about scope when something's in the local scope or when something's in the global scope. So this is what I'm referring to. The global scope is literally a big bubble around everything else. And then you have a local scope or multiple local scopes, depending on what your Python, is do, Python script is doing. OK, so a bit more about scope. You knew I was going to say something. The function name exists in the global scope. So it can be called from the global scope. Parameters are in the local scope, so they can only be called from it, the local scope of the function. And that's the local scope of the function. And that's the local scope of the function. However, the return statement makes the value available to the global scope. So what you've got is you've got like a portal in to the function, which is using the function name. And you've got a portal out of the function by using the return statement. So I used to work for a mathematician, and she called them goes into's and goes out's. 
So we have gozintas that are going into the function, goes out of which goes out as which are coming out. Um, a function can be called from any scope. If the function is defined in the global the global scope, it can be called from anywhere. However, it has to be defined before you call it. So my rule of thumb is when I'm writing functions, I will often um, I will often just write my functions at the top of my script or I'll write them in their own module. And then I will use the code that needs those functions underneath the definition. So literally, you'll see def, 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 def in the beginning of a Python script. And then you'll see where it's getting used later in the code. And then arguments make data available from the global scope to the local scope. OK. Arguments and mutability. OK, so basically this is just the swap function. And basically what we're doing is we are um, taking a list and we're swapping the values in that list and we're returning the list back. So I have here good things just end all. And I'm going to split it. So I'm going to create a list. And I'm going to send the list into the function. Now, you'll notice that there's no return value on that function. And there's a good reason, and that's because certain types in Python are mutable, which means they, that a pointer to them hangs around, and you get whatever changes you are made. You are made. So I have this gobbledygook in a list. I've called the swap function, and I have passed it that list. So now let's see what I'm going to do. I'm going to, well, I'm going to take, I'm going to swap, put the first value in 0. I'm going to take the last value and put it in 0, and take the temp and put it in the last value. And then I'll say all good things just end here. So now, I'm going to print this if the, a list were not mutable, I would have had to return something. I do not have to return something because a list type is mutable, which means I get the changes for free. I don't have to remember to put a return in the function. And objects are that way in Python. Most objects list dictionaries are mutable. And so if you change it inside of a function, you'll automatically get that change um, based on the function call once you're, once you're back in the scope that's outside that function. I feel like I didn't explain that well. We'll keep going. And if you guys have questions, let me know. And I will try and do a better job of explaining it. Actually, what time is it? I think we can do another. I think I can explain it better this way. 5.12.1, 5.12.1. OK, so this is what I was just doing. Now, you'll notice, here we go. You'll notice that in the swap function, I'm actually changing the list, OK? I've got temp, and I'm going to set it equal to the first value in the list. I'm going to take the last value in the list and set it to the first, set it to index 0. And I'm going to take the thing that was at index 0 and set it to the last element in the list. So I've changed that list in the local scope. And everything that I've learned up until this time says that, OK, I have to return it if I want to see the list with the values swapped. But because of mutability of certain objects in Python, you don't necessarily have to return an object. If it's an integer, you've got to return it. String, float, Boolean, you've got to return it. But there are some things like lists and dictionaries that you don't have to. Um, so, and we're actually going to talk a little bit more about mutability and what's mutable and what's not when we get to um, objects in week eight. So 
I'm going to input some stuff and then I'm going to swap those values, but you'll notice there's no variable on the left of swap. There's no variable equals swap because I don't have to have it because the list will change and I'll get those changes. Again, lists and dictionaries are fine. You, you always have to return if you have integers, um, strings, floats, booleans. So let's just debug this real quick. Five, two, one. Okay, so um, yeah. So I have stopped at values and I'm going to input things but with a comma and it's going to split them. So I'm going to go to the console and I'm going to say whoops whoops I forgot my commas B C D A yes Okay, I think it's called stack. We'll do the same in place of temp or does it alter the code? Um, do you mean stack space in a program or do you mean um, or do you mean like a FIFO where you're putting it onto the, the front A equals C, B equals A? Okay, yeah. Um, Similar, but that's that's kind of more talking about what's going on inside the function. Um, so let's run through this, and I'll see if you have any other questions, Kevin, because I think this might be the best way to answer that. So I've input E, B, C, D, A, and what I'd like to get out is A, B, C, D, E. So am I still? I'm not. Am I still going or did I stop? I stopped, didn't I? Okay, let's start this again. Let's stop and rerun. Okay, let's do this again. Okay, I do not know what's going on right now. Hold on, stop. Everything is stopped. Debug, good, I'm debugging now. Okay, so. Step over. What minus one does in this example is it says the last element. So list to swap has five elements. So if I want to get at the very last element and never have to worry about doing a length, I use the minus one. So E D A. Okay, so here are my values. It's been split into a list. I'm going to call swap. I'm going to step into swap, and I'm going to, we can look at the variables here, temp is now E. Um, so now, because I said uh, list to swap of zero is list to swap of minus one. It's taken the last value, which was a, and put it into the first value. And then it's going to take the last value and temp equal to the last value. So that's all fine and good. So now when I go to print it, again, I didn't have to return anything. And my console has the list A, B, C, D, E. So I think, Kevin, it's pretty much talking about what you were talking about. Okay. So, we're doing okay on time. Yeah. Default parameters. Remember I said you always have to call a function with the same number of parameters? Now I'm going to make a liar out of myself. That's not exactly true. Um, I just need to sit. Sorry. That's not exactly true. 
I can have what are called default parameters so that I don't have to I don't have to rely on someone else to tell me what the base is of the value I'm working with because if somebody, you know, if, if you're expecting integers and somebody calling that passes in a string, that's a problem. You can change that with types though. Um, but it also allows the programmer to not always have to put in values when they don't have one. And so that's one of the things that default uh, parameter values do. So what do we have? Well, we have our def statement. We have numbers, number of pennies, and we have two parameters. We have a parameter dollars and a parameter pennies. Dollars is just dollars with a comma after it. Pennies has this new thing equal zero. Equal zero says if nobody bothers to pass a second argument in, then the value of that argument is zero and the name is pennies. So that's why that looks like an assignment, because it is. You're assigning the variable pennies to zero, to the value zero, unless somebody calls number of pennies with two values. If they call with two values, then penny is going to equal whatever that second value is. But if somebody only calls it with one value, then pennies is going to be zero. So that's why that looks like an assignment. It is an assignment. Okay, so I put in four. Four goes up and then dollars because I've only um, sent in one variable. I've only given one argument. And so it's going to be, and so pennies is zero. So it's going to be 4 times 100 plus 0, which can be 400. Because it's going to return that for the print statement. So now I'm going to call it with two different inputs. I'm going to input a 5. I'm going to input a 6. 5, it goes up to dollars. 6 goes up to pennies. And my value is 506. So that's what the default parameter does. And when we were dealing with range last week, I mean, you could give it one number or two numbers or three numbers. The range function has default. Now, one thing that you will notice here, and it's important to keep in mind, default parameters have to come after parameters without defaults. I could not define pennies equal zero comma dollars. It would just not have allowed me to do that. So actually let's go play with that and see what kind of mischief we can get into. Okay, so I have number of pennies, dollars comma pennies. Now if I didn't have pennies there at all, I would first of all get a syntax error there. Um, I wanted to see if it was going to give me an error there. I don't think it is. So, but one of the things that I can't do is pennies equals zero. It, Python won't let me. It will tell me that non-default parameter follows default parameter, which is the truth. What it's telling me is that I can't have this before that. Now, I could have this. I could have default parameters for both of them, but I can't have a, very, a, a parameter with default, or default values followed by one that is not. So it's important just to know that because some people will try some of these labs and they'll go crazy. Um, and then Here's a return. I think we're good with that. Okay. Okay. Multi returns. Multi returns are awesome. They're something that very few languages have. I think I've been playing with Rust because I think I'm going to have to learn it for work. 
They have multi-returns, but Java doesn't have multi-returns. C and C++ don't have multi-returns. Well, what am I going on about this whole multi-return thing? The nice thing about Python, and it's the way you can return things, is you don't have to create an, a structure just to return two or three or ten um, elements from a function. You can just return them. I know it probably seems like it's reasonable, but this is something that pretty much didn't happen except in Python, and certainly in no language that I've worked on other than Python. And it's very handy, um, and it, in some ways it makes code simpler because you're not have to necessarily define something else like a list to put things in. So what am I babbling about? Um, well, I've got this function move, okay? And move has, uh, I've got um, two lists. Sorry, I went backwards. I've got a function move. Move takes two lists as parameters. And then I'm going to swap those lists. So in my function call, you'll see that I have something different on the left-hand side of my call to move. I have L1 comma space L2. What in the world is that doing? What that is doing is it's saying, first of all, hey, Python, I know you're going to give me two things back here. So here are my variables to put those in. Whatever the first value is that come back, comes back from return, put it in L1. Whatever the second value is that comes back from return, put it in L2. Now, it's important to look at this and, and understand what this is, partly because you're going to have to write a function called swap and do this. Not with lists, but with uh, just regular values, no structures. So I call move it with a list, one, two, three, and I call move it with another list, four, five, six. So I'm going to now return both lists after shuffling things around. So I'm going to return 153 after what we need to do in the function is done. And I'm going to return 426. And L1 is going to have the value of 153. And list 2 is going to have the list value of 426. And I'm going to print 153. And I'm going to print 426. So this this is very handy if you're programming in Python a lot. If you're not, you're going to have to still do this for a lab this week. So you have to understand the multi-returns because you know that, you know, the, the calculating dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies? Well, you're going to do that one again, except now you're going to make it into a function. And that function is going to have to return multiple values. It's going to have to return dollars, quarters, nickels, dimes, and pennies from the function that you're using. So it's important to understand multiple returns. Um, they're based on a position in the return statement. It's all passed by assignment. Okay, so there's no, there's no, um, there's no link between list one and L1 other than the position that list one and L1 are in in the return and in the assignment that's going to happen um, after that return. Okay, unlike a lot of languages, Python allows multiple return values from a single function. Okay, so now we're getting into the labs. Um, so lab five, what am I doing? This is a swap function. So we actually have two things because in Zybooks you're also going to read about the main function. And the main function is basically the place where Java, sorry, not Java, shoot me, I was doing too much Java today. Um, the main function is the place where Python will always start if it can and if you tell about it. In this case, we have a, a main function and Zybooks actually does a really good job of describing it. But it starts off with an if and then it, it's if underscore underscore name double equal, and this is 
those are very specific. You have to have underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore, and you have to have in quotes, underscore, underscore, main, underscore, underscore, end quote. That's a lot to say that that's how you define a main function in Python. And that's just a place to start. That's all it is. If you've got a bunch of function definitions, sometimes you don't want to just have code in the global scope, so you're going to define a main function. And here's what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to set, I've got two inputs, user input one and user input two, and I want to swap those. So I've got to have a multi-return. And yes, this is one of those things where people can do it in multiple ways, but when I'm looking at your, when I'm looking at your code for this lab in Zybooks, I want to see that you're actually doing the swap inside the function and that you are returning multiple, variable, multiple values and using them correctly. So I have a set output one comma output two equals swap values user input one and user input two. So I call swap values and I have a function defined called swap values with two parameters. What I'm going to go do in there is I'm going to swap the actual values out of the parameters. So I'm going to set parameter 1 to temp. Parameter 1 then gets set to parameter 2. Parameter 2 gets set to temp and I return param 1 and param 2. They will respectively get placed in output 1 and output 2 and then I will print them. So there, even though some people can make a lot of real shortcuts on this one. You have to make sure that you're actually doing the multi-return and having that set statement correct in my class because I'll look. Okay, 5.19 is our dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies from Module 3. If you did that correct in Module 3, my suggestion is you copy that stuff out of the Module 3, you copy it into 5.19, and then you modify it. You don't have to start everything from scratch. This is really about encapsulating a portion of that function into, sorry, a portion of that lab into a function. So the portion that we're encapsulating into a function is the actual calculations, not print, but the calculations. So I have a function called exact change. It takes one uh, parameter, and that parameter is user input. So there are my calculations. I have, I'm going to set a function, uh, a variable called dollars to the number of dollars. I'm going to set the quarters to whatever the number of quarters comes out to be. So forward dimes, nickels, and pennies. And then, because it's a function, I'm going to return from it dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So all of the things that I've created in the calculation, I am going to return. So I'm going to return one, two, three, four, pot values from this function. And then what am I going to do with those five values? Well, I'm doing it right here. I'm going to have I'm going to have variables dollars, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies be assigned to the values that are coming out of exact change. And then I just need to now do that same part that was on the bottom part of three, where you're just going through and you're doing all these if statements to figure out how to print them out. That's what you're doing now. So. Inside the main function, because this is having this is the main function again, um, I'm going to call. I'm going to get user input. I'm going to call exact change, which is going to figure out all the exact change. Then I'm going to figure out how to print it out properly. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel for 5.19. You can start with what you did for module three. Okay. So is that it? Oh, that's it. I, for some reason, thought we had uh, three labs for lab, three labs for module five. So I'm glad we don't. Anybody have any questions? 
And yes, we can open up the mics if you guys want to. How is it producing multiple outputs? Well, it's producing multiple output. Well, let's, let's start with there are multiple variables, and each of those variables have a value. So, for instance, in let's just do swap. Okay. What is this? Oh, this is the exact change one. 5.18. Okay. So that's the swap one. Why is this one exact change? Anyway. So this one will be like swap. Let's look at that. So 5.18 was the one that you had to swap. So I don't want to do that. Whoops. Still writing Java. Okay. So here... I've got two inputs in action. I'm just going to make this A and B to be a little easier. B, A, B, and then C, D, and print. I'm not being very uh, imaginative with my variable names. So what do we have here? I'm going to swap some values. Okay, I've got a function called swap, it takes in two parameters and it returns two values. And I'm going to actually, I think I'm just going to, well, I'm going to do in user input A and B, and then I'm going to swap A and B, and I'm going to set the value that's in A that's returned into C, and the value of B that's returned in to D and then I'm going to print them. So let's just step through this guy. Test. Okay. So I'm just going to debug. So it wants um, I'm going to put one. I'm being really unimaginative tonight. and three. Okay? So I have my variables A and B, which is one and three respectively. So now I'm going to step in to swap. So that step in, so I have X is one and Y is three. I'm going to then temp equal X, X equal Y, and Y equals temp. So now I'm going to return two values. I have x, which has the value 3, and y, which has the value 1. So what it's going to do is it's going to say it's positional. So it's going to say x is going to be, the value of x is going to be returned and placed in value c. The value of y is going to be returned and placed in value D. So if I step over that, I still haven't defined it. Um, you'll still see those variables aren't there yet. But as soon as I step over that function call, I have C is 3 and D is 1, and then I can print them. Did that help answer your question, Kevin? And you can go ahead and open up the mic if you want. And anybody else can as well. Okay. You can open up your mic and we can talk about it. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right. Um, it just looks like it's going through the same code. Like, uh, like the same variables are being put in and it's pop, like uh, I'm trying to do the lab with this one and if I remove the return and print the statement up above it'll give me the first one but if I remove the print from the first one and put the return in it'll give me the other three but not the first one so I'm trying to understand this multiple um, outputs Okay, so 
I'm just trying to get so you tried it by putting a print statement in the swap values, right? Yes. Okay. And that got you the correct output. Was that right? For the first one, it was like five and three, I think. Okay. Um, but it didn't get you the right thing for any of the other ones. No. Okay. Um, so my guess is what's happening is, well, there's a couple things that could happen. Sometimes people put values in here rather than the variables associated with those values. So one thing to check is to make sure, um, yes, David, they are recorded. And it'll be up on my YouTube channel tomorrow. Sorry, Kevin. Um, so let's let's let me take a step back. Does your um, swap values look similar to this? Yes. Okay. Do you have a return that looks similar to that? Yes. Okay. So here, do you have a do you have two variables on the left hand side of a single equal sign separated by a comma? What I put down was uh, like def swap by use user value one user value two, and then I go through all of that using user value one and user value two. Input is user value one user value two. And then where you have C and D, I have user value one and user value two as well. Okay. So, so let's just do that. So user value one, user value two. This is value one, user value two. that and then we can go through and see what it's doing okay and you have user value here as well right yeah all the letters are replaced with user value one or use value two depending on if they're first or second or if temp is swapping around okay That's User value one, user value one, user value one, and this is user value two. So this will look pretty much like, assuming I can copy and paste, this will look somewhat like yours, correct? Yeah. Okay. So let's see what happens. So I'm just going to go here, and I'm going to debug, and it's going to. So I'm going to say user value 1 is 3, and user value 2 is 42, just to make them easier to differentiate. So that's exactly what I wanted it to do. So let's step in to swap values. So I have user value 1 is 3 and user value 2 is 42. So we're going to do the swapping. So now we have user value 1 is 42 and user value 2 is 3. So now I'm going to return, let's double check, 42 and 3. Yes, they're positional. So I'm going to step over this. And back on this line, these two are still their old values, 3 and 42. So let's see what happens when I step over them. User value 1 is now 42. User value 2 is now 3, and they'll print out correctly. That's not what you're seeing, is it? it yeah, when I print out this code, it'll give me the bottom three, but it'll say my first one is wrong. Um, Okay, but it looks just like this? Yeah. Okay. Um, is it a spacing error? Or what, is it, what is it telling you? Uh, no, mine looks just like yours. Where yours says, uh, uh, what is it, um, hashtag list equals X and Y, 
that's where I have a print statement in the same hashtag section mm -hmm. just to see if I could swap them around. But for whatever reason, there are four outputs in Zybooks. When I do it this way, it'll give me the bottom three, but it won't give me the first one. And then if I do print up in the, the death part, it'll give me the first one, but not the bottom three. That's why I'm trying to understand this multiple values because it's like, uh, it doesn't make sense. Because, yeah, it looks accurate. It's 100%. Um, yeah. <laughs> it looks like this. It should be working like this. Yeah? Yeah. And I should be able to do this any number of times and it yeah. swaps it correctly. That's why I was wondering if maybe um, A and B equals B and A had something to do with it, but I changed it out to temp and it produced the same thing. Now, I mean, you can try, you can change this to X and Y and A and B, but what happens inside here, what happens inside the swap values function and how those values get returned doesn't change, just the values change. Either yeah variable names, the only thing that's going to happen is the values change. So I don't know what is going on with yours. <laughs> I mean, you're welcome to take a screen capture and show me, you know, your code if you want, although the school might frown on it, but mm -hmm. they're still here. There's still a lot of people here. Um, so, yeah, just uh, put up your code. We'll figure it out as a class. People, you know, they'll be fine. I'm making this available to everyone. So, so go ahead and take a screen capture of your code, and we can work through it. While we're waiting, does anybody have any other questions about any of any of what we're doing and we're about to do? I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay. Cool. Okay. And by the way, for anybody else who's here, you don't have to stick around at this point. I'm just going to work through a problem with Kevin, and you guys are welcome to stay. You don't have to stay. Okay. Def swap values. Ah, okay. You're not doing exactly the same thing as I am. <laughs> so that won't work. What you need to do is you need to actually do the temp thing. I mean, we can try it with this code but and see what it does. Let's do that. Yeah, the, I changed it back to that way. Everything above 10 is like just comments to myself. Okay. So let's just do this. Let's see what Python tells us. So we can say... Yeah, I don't think this is going to work, but let's give it a try. <laughs> so we're going to do 3 and 42 because they were easy to see. So now I'm going to call swap. I'm going to step into swap, and it's going to say two, user value 2, user value 1 equals user value 1, user value 2. 
So what's going to happen here to my variables? 1 is 42 and 3 and user value 2 is 3. So that's 42 and that's 3. So let us step over, step over. So this is 42 and 3. It swapped it. It did work. That's why I'm pulling my hair out. Like, why is this not working? What value is it, um, is it not doing for you? Um, there are... Let me pull up the lab really quick. Do you mind if uh, Jocelyn asks a question while you're pulling that up? Yeah, no problem. Okay, go ahead, Jocelyn. Okay, so let's go look at the rubric and we'll see what that is. So this is what we're turning in for week five, correct? Oh, I can't do that. I don't have everything up. So this is the dragon game, I believe. Five, six. Yeah, this is the dragon game. So what you're supposed to do, well, minute, let me get into my accounts. And we'll open it up and see. Read through it together. Don't know why it takes this authenticator so long. So let's get into Brightspace. And we will go to Learning Modules, Module 5, and let's take a look at the rubric. Um, project one submission requirements and rubric. Okay, I will look at that in just a minute, Kevin. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so um, you create text-based games. You're going to design a game as part of an idea pitch. So what you have to do this week is you have to create a storyboard to plan your game using one of the templates. Um, and basically what you want to do this week, what you're doing this week is you are creating a storyboard and you're giving a written description of what your game is. Um, next week we will do some more stuff, but that's what this week is for. So the storyboard is just a map. What it really is is your eight rooms. You have to define eight rooms for your game. And your player moves between those rooms on steps four and five. Okay, so create pseudo go code or a flow chart that logically outlines the steps that will allow the player to move between rooms. Okay, create pseudo code or a flow chart that logically outlines the steps that will allow the player to get the item from the room they are in and add it to their inventory. So there are a couple of things here that we have to understand. One is that the player is going to move and that there's a concept of an inventory and the player's going to get things and carry it with them. So the first one I find can be very conceptually difficult for students because, especially new students, because we talk about moving between rooms, we're getting up, we're physically walking into another room, and then maybe we're sitting down again, but we're in a divided space and we're moving between that divided space however we move. You can't do that in Python. So how do you do that? You do that by setting a variable. So let's say, okay. Okay, we'll go in and look at that one in just a minute. Is that okay, Kevin? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So for moving between, between rooms, what do you have to do in a program to go from one room to another. Well, you have the concept of a current room. I'm sitting in my living room. My, my current room is my living room. I want to go to the kitchen. 
And when I'm in the kitchen, the kitchen will be my current room. So the current room changes, the value of current room changes from living room to kitchen. And that's how you change it in Python. You simply set another variable. So where is the user, where they're coming from? Can they get to where they're going? Is that move allowed? And then you return the value that's going to be the new current room. So you have four moves, north, south, east, and west. And what you want to define is a generic pseudocode, not, you know, I'm in room A and I want to go into room B. You want to say, I have where I'm starting, my current room, and I have a direction, north, south, east, or west. Based on that direction, and can I get from my current room to the new room? And if so, then I return the new room. And if not, then I tell it it's valid. It's not valid. So that does that help with a little bit with four? You don't need to let, well, the flow chart, is it a flow chart, a pseudocode or a flow chart? What you're doing here is you are, you don't have to define every single room. We already know about collections and lists. We don't know about dictionaries, but you don't have to know about all of that to basically say there's a concept of a current room. And there's a concept of my ability to move. So can I move from the current room? So you don't have to do it for everyone because in your final program, it won't be for everyone. All this stuff's going to be in structures. For five, um, yes. For five, um, you're going to want to do something simple, but now what you have is you have a stu you, you have a player. The player's in a room and they want to pick something up and carry it with them. So the person who is behind the keyboard is the player. You don't have to worry about that person. What you do have to worry about is saying, how do I get the thing from this room and put it in some place where I can keep it? Well, the inventory is where you're going to keep it. So you're going to place the item that you pick up from the room and put it into the inventory, which means you're going to, let's say the inventory is a list, um, you're going to take the item that is in that room, so it is an item with some kind of value to it, and that value is, you know, golden helmet or whatever. And you're going to take that value and it's going to get put into the inventory like a list. And then the next time the person comes into the room and they want to get something, it's going to happen again. So again, it's generic code. It's not really even code. It's generic pseudocode. What you're doing is looking for the logical steps, including, you know, that inventory equal list or whatever that is. So let's go back to your stuff, Kevin. Let's see. I can't make it bigger. Come on. There we go. So we have ah, minus 1 and 10, 9 and 0, 11 and 11, and then we have 4 and 5. 4 and 5, your output 4 and 5. All right, let's give it a try. Four and five. I'm just going to be lazy. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to call my swap. So it's four and five. When I step over that, it should be five and four. I'm returning. Oh, value one is four and five. 
So this is when that falls down. Value one. Let's do this again. Okay. Let's do this again. That's where this falls down. The user value is 5 in here, and it's 4 in there. When I step over, huh, it's 5. No, it's 4 and 5. So now let's do something. Let's do this and try it again, that that will work. Okay, so we have four and five. We're gonna go step over five and four. I'm not sure why this does not work, but that's probably because I've always done it like this. Yes, okay. I can't give you an exact explanation. This is one of those things like when you're in JavaScript, there's a there's a different potential set of responses if you do equal equal as opposed to if you do equal equal equal. So <laughs> things in the language. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know why this doesn't work, but. When I've ever, whenever I've written a swap function, I've always written it like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Going once, going twice. Everybody have a very good evening, and um, this should be up tomorrow on the YouTube channel.